I have one simple goal in life, one small desire, one fleeting thing that I need, which is for the government of the UK to abolish the Equalities Act. And I will explain why in but a moment. So there's been a lot of talk over the past who knows how long at this point, I've honestly lost track of a lot of it, of all of the issues going on with trans ideology and the battle between trans activists and TERFs, that being trans exclusionary radical feminists in the colloquial term, and what they want, it, this is a kind of battle that has now taken its way to Parliament. And it seems that the TERFs are winning, as we have covered a few times. But the way that they are winning is rather concerning to me. The way that they are likely to secure and cement their gains will be, for anybody who is a fan of civil liberties and freedom in the English sense, um, it will be detrimental to all of that moving forwards. And on that basis, I thought it would be time to refer everybody to an older article that I've referred to a few times, which is very, very interesting because it gets to the heart of a lot of what we talk about and the cause, the real root causes for a lot of what goes on in the world today, especially in the West, which is this article from good old Hugo, who's not been here for a long time at this point, but it is still always a relevant one to point people to, which is why you are a criminal, which is talking about the absolute labyrinth, the maze of legislation and laws that exist in the UK and most Western European countries, including the USA, um, that mean that there is nothing that you can really do in any circumstance, in any walk of life, that means you are not breaking some obscure law that you have never heard of, because that's how they get you. And if you're wondering why all of these companies these days go woke, it's not necessarily because at first they wanted to, or even that they believed in a lot of the, the ideology that was put forward. It was mainly because they wanted to avoid litigation for legislation that's been passed that they might, be in, uh, might not be uh, sticking to. They might be breaking the law entirely by accident, just trying to run their business by, say, having a code of dress which is oh, okay. absolutely ridiculous, which is what I'm going to be talking about here. Now, I was made aware of this by um, this particular stream, uh, Anti-Woke in a Post-Woke World. It was very interesting, and I would recommend you go and listen to that. That's Scrump and Evelyn. And uh, they were talking about if woke is put away, as some people suggest that it is, what happens to the Anti-Woke Coalition? You mean that it will? No, if it is. This is, this is a, this is a um, theory that is being put forward by some, okay, yeah. uh, that the elites, because they re can recognise what an optical failure woke is, that they are going to try and sideline it and put it away. So this wouldn't necessarily get rid of all the problems that it's caused, but it would turn it into a PR victory, and certainly the TERFs would be at the forefront of that, and some conservative commentators as well. The problems wouldn't go away, they would just be taken out of the headlines, essentially, is the uh, theory that's being put forward there. And this could be one way that it's going about, because in that stream they were talking about the Equalities Act, and I thought, oh, I'll look into this a little bit more. So. When we talk about the battle between trans and TERFs, as I've mentioned, it's going to Parliament and this article is talking about it. So what would changing the Equality Act mean for trans people and single-sex spaces? Kemi Badenoch is considering amending the Act to define people's sex as biological sex in England, Scotland and Wales. A significant change to the 2010 Equality Act is being pursued by the government, which would redefine sex to refer specifically to a person's sex at birth. That would be des uh, designed to make it legal for those who are transgender to be banned from single-sex spaces spaces and events. Currently, trans people can have their identity formally recognised by applying for a gender recognition certificate. Badenoch wants to make it clearer uh, to make a clearer distinction in law between those who are born a particular sex and those who transition, and she wrote to the Equality and Human Rights Commission seeking its advice. There was a recent petition as well which was signed by 107,000 people and called for the Act to make clear sex related to biological sex and not someone's gender. Now, there was also a counter-petition that got, I think, 127,000 signatures calling for the Equalities Act to be strengthened to allow for people to, um, to determine their own gender without having it to refer to biological sex as well. But both of those were packaged into one for this debate that went on in Parliament. Updating the current law, which was passed by Gordon Brown's government, would probably require fresh primary, le uh, primary legislation. Sorry, what was it about? Was it about to allow people to self-identify? Oh, what, the secondary petition? Yeah. Because, I mean... Yes, yeah, so it was essentially saying either keep the law as it is, which allows yeah. that anyway, or uh, update it to make it stronger for uh, in, in favour of trans people. Okay. 
essentially. And in this Pink News article, they described some of what was going on. So the politicians debated the two different petitions, uh, as I've mentioned before. And this is where I get very suspicious, because as we know, from everything that went on during the COVID lockdowns and the petitions that were signed and then immediately thrown in the bin by Parliament, the government do not debate these things unless it's absolutely in their best interests to do so. So when it was time for COVID lockdowns and COVID vaccines and all of the other things that people were signing petitions against, the government looked at those even if they got over 100,000 signatures. For those of you not in the UK, we have a system whereby there is a government website where you can sign petitions. If it gets over 10,000, the government has to provide a written piece of response, a written response to the petition. If it gets over 100,000, they are forced to actually debate it in parliament. A lot of these got over 100,000 signatures. But they were never debated. No, they, they were debated for oh. less than five minutes where all of the MPs stood up and said, I disagree with what this petition is asking for us to do. Goodbye. And it was just updated like that on the website. And then everybody just got told that your opinion is thrown in the bin. Sorry, that's ridiculous. It's like, okay, we have all these signatures. Why? Because we want you to just shout, shout one word. Which is no. Yeah. They, they don't want to go, me. it's a... I or nay, it's always, ah, the nays have it. There you go. That's always what it ends up being. So the very fact that this got such a serious look in at Parliament in the first place suggests to me that this is something that works in the favour of the politicians, and we always know that the politicians never have our best interests in mind now, do they? So if I carry on through this, the... In uh, 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 is, that, is that for real? Politicians do occasionally lie. Oh. And they may not always have the people's interests in mind. In fact, oftentimes they're just looking out for themselves. Now, this might be a hell of a red pill for you to swallow. I know you didn't think that you'd be joining the Lotus Eaters to that, that kind of insider info. but I must say that this is really deep insight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to break your illusions. I broke the spell. Yeah. You're out of the matrix now, bro. You're we in the real world. We did world. this on Symposium uh, 17, where we talked about Aristotle and the... And the good and bad constitutions, by the way. Yes, we've got... Ch check it out. The way our constitution is functioning at the moment is um, non-functional, I think <laughs> I would describe it as. Either way, I'll carry on with this. So in April, um, the chair of the UK Equalities Watchdog, Baroness Kishwa Faulkner, wrote to Women and Equalities Minister Kemi Badenoch and provided advice on altering the Equality Act. Uh, she said that while there was no straightforward balance in the matter, changing the definition of sex to biological sex would bring greater legal clarity and thus merits further consideration. This clarity, she stated, would be particularly seen in eight areas, including the existence of single-sex spaces, such as freedom of association for lesbians and gay men, but not straight men. Not straight men. They don't have any freedom of association. We don't get to have men's clubs or boys' clubs or anything like that Because anymore. freedom of association may lead to... Let's increased As chances found, of the of mean words being said to people. Mean words, yeah. So I mean, well, let's let's lock them. Let's destroy civil liberties. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> so that's so the UN don't thinking get mean on words the matter. Yeah. Now, in a speech by Miriam Cates, the MP for Penistone and Stockbridge, she made reference to drag queen events for children, making, uh, according to Pink News here, and I'm just reporting this, I don't have an opinion of this myself, YouTube, uh, abhorrent claims that trans rights results in ordinary toddlers being used to satisfy the sexual fetish of adult men dressed as eroticized women. That's about as deep as the rhetoric goes in this. I did try, I, tr I tried to watch the actual debate because the whole thing is up on YouTube, but it's four hours long. And it's just people saying the most banal stuff yeah, that boring, you've heard yeah. over and over and over again. Nothing is really discussed. Nothing is really concluded. By the end, they just go, Com do you know what the, they do at the end of these debates? They do the I and the nays. Do you know what the I and the nays were for this time? No. Just to confirm that, yes, we have discussed this. Can we all agree that we've discussed this? I, congratulations. We'll move on to it and talk about it again some other time. Democracy yeah. in action, people. It's really funny that uh, now one of the major questions that people ask, uh, you know, politicians and, you know, mayors who run for office is like, you know, what is a woman? And I have a friend, Brit, I know you're watching, who sent uh, questions to various mayors where she is living, various candidates. And she said, please, can you just tell me what is a woman? And I, I will consider voting for you if you just give me uh, a straight answer a, a straight on this. Answer. And uh, almost no one gave her a response. <laughs> Terrified. Just of the one question. person says, you know, ad, you know, adults, the, the, the word that YouTube female. don't want us to say it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. 
We would confirm our own opinions, but we have no opinions for the sake of pleasing Neil Mohan, the great Raj of YouTube. Yeah. So I shall carry on with this. Jo uh, Helen Joyce, who's written a book on this called Trans as well, was commenting on it, talking about how uh, some people were, point uh, were complaining about this. And she said, oh, the debate was about the meaning of sex and the Equality Act. Everyone has a sex, whether they identify as trans or not. It's a matter that affects 100% of people, most specifically women and gay people. And lots of them spoke. It was democracy in action. Now, but personally... I don't think that the best way to strengthen democracy, if that is even a particularly desirable goal at this point, is to strengthen the Equalities Act. Because once again, uh, the Equalities Act is not a particularly good piece of legislation. You know that it's a terrible piece of legislation because it was passed under New Labour. In fact, any amount of any legislation whatsoever, as far as I'm concerned, that has been passed in the 21st century by the UK government is probably worthy of being repealed because they've <laughs> our government have done nothing good for the past 23 years and uh, let's look into why that is so the equalities act 2010 was the one that we're mainly focusing on but it did um, uh, there was an act that preceded this called the equality act 2006 and i'll explain what this was so it's a precursor to the two, uh, 2010 equality act which combines all of the equality enactments within great britain and provides comparable protections across all equality strands. Those explicitly mentioned by the Equality Act 2006 include age, disability, sex proposed, commenced uh, or completed gender re reassignment, race, religion or belief, and sexual orientation. The changes it made were creating the Equality and Human Rights Commission, from here on referred to as the EHRC, which merged the Commission for Racial Equality, the Equal, Equality, uh, Equal Opportunities Commission, and the Disability Rights Commission. It also outlawed the discrimination on goods and services on the grounds of religious belief, so, subject to certain exemptions, which basically means that if you run a business and you don't want to serve to a particular type of customer, horrible as that may be, exclusionary, discriminatory as that may be, that you're not allowed to do that anymore by law. That's something that I disagree with. Allowing the government to introduce regulations outlawing discrimination on the ground of sexual orientation in goods and services. Once again, that's the same thing. Creating a public duty to equality, to promote equality on the ground of gender. So that would be, say, getting quotas in businesses to force them to have a certain amount of parity with men and women and the way that they pay men and women you know gender uh, gender yeah. pay gap all of that good stuff that we've that has been debunked many many times before if we go to the next one let's look Sorry, at what this is this is not 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 your topic but the 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 laws and all this but it's just boring <laughs> isn't it well, it's difficult to go through, but one of the reasons that I think that it's boring is because it makes it more difficult to counter any of it because nobody yeah. wants to go yeah, through. That wasn't a thing uh, some, pages. some decades ago. Yeah, but nobody wants to go through pages and pages and pages of obscure legislation, which is horribly dull to go through, but has a very meaningful impact on your life and all of the behavior of the people yep. around you. Because whether you know it or not, these laws matter. They have an impact. You can be held liable under them if you are found to be uh, to be acting in contradiction yeah. to them. If you're found to break these laws, whether you know it or not, you are liable yeah. for that. And that's one of the reasons that a lot of businesses have adopted the woke agenda, as I, I see it. I, what, what I meant, because it, it's good yep. to be clear about it, I didn't say that people shouldn't uh, read about the law or... Okay, but I said that, well, I mean, you know, I just find it very difficult all to these go through problems, well. they're, they're creating problems out of nowhere in order to to make our lives more difficult. That, that's what well, I mean. Well, if you believe in the conception of the managerial state, it's essentially to make sure that they always have jobs to give other managers. If they can create new bits of legislation that create new functions within society that requires new departments, then you can fill those departments with people that you are friends with who believe the same things and that you do. And who support you politically. Who supports you politically? Yeah. Well, I mean, you get votes either way, and then whatever you said that you would do when you get the votes for it, you just don't do it. Yeah, but you can <laughs> enlarge the state by, you know, giving jobs to people that would not necessarily need it, mm -hmm. and you tax people more in order to fund these departments. And also, you have major bureaucracies with people who they just want to justify their salary. And, you know, if you give a bureaucrat some you know a mission he or she will find <laughs> they'll never trouble. find they an will end create to that mission trouble. yes so if we have let's say bureaucracies of people who are supposed to find you know hate or whatever they'll turn everyone into a criminal just like the article hugo wrote yes. and says 
in and now we get onto the Equality Act 2010, which, as I mentioned, consolidates a lot of the legislation that came before it, including the Equal Pay Act of 1970, Sex Discrimination Act 1975, Race Relations Act 76, Disability Discrimination Act 95, and three major statutory instruments protecting discrimination in employment on grounds of religion or belief, sexual orientation, and age. The Act has broadly the same goals as the four major EU Equal Treatment Directive, whose provisions it mirrors and implements. However, the Act also offers protection beyond the EU directives, protecting against discrimination based on a person's nationality and citizenship, and also extending for individuals' rights in areas of life beyond the workplace, in religion or belief, disability, blah, 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 the protected characteristics. Now let's go on to the actual document itself. You're probably already aware of this, but they've got the protected characteristics in here, which include age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage, civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion or belief, sex and sexual orientation, and all of this will be administered by the EHRC. And they're the ones who get to determine subjectively, because when it's just written down on the page, well, you can say, well, religion or belief, well, that includes Christianity, race, that will include um, ethnicity of, of British people, white people, etc. But it never actually gets applied that way, does it? Because the people in the EHRC have their own beliefs on how these bits of legislation should be applied. There is something that flies frequently under the radar. Mm -hmm. And because when we see someone who puts forward a piece of legislation that says, you know, anti-discrimination laws that are supposed to penalize discrimination, of course, we first thing we should be asking is what constitutes discrimination. And the problem is, and this is what flies under the radar, is that there is no coherent way of action or that, no, sorry, there is no way that any piece of action will not count as discrimination against one group. Because when you have completely incompatible groups with who have views about what constitutes peaceful coexistence that are incompatible, agreeing with one or at least tolerate one is... Can be seen uh, as a form of discrimination uh, to yes, another against group the as other. well. Yes. And that's why you end up with companies adopting these gigantic HR departments, they adopt these gigantic compliance departments, purely because of the fact that they need a gigantic legal yeah. apparatus at hand at all times to make sure that they're never breaking these laws. Okay. And nobody knows how to not break these laws, so they end up going the most ridiculous routes possible. Exactly, and it functions like a presumption of guilt. It's you are guilty from the first on, from the first place, and let me, let us just see if we're gonna be you know lenient with you or not. Yes, I mean, for instance, on, on that, um, first of all, there is a very disconcerting sect, section that's the very first one, which says that the government has a public sector duty regarding socio-economic inequalities, which has never been implemented formally. The When the Tory government coalition with the uh, Liberal Democrats came in in 2010, and they put through this after Gordon Brown had signed it through, uh, they didn't actually implement that one. But it is lying in dormant for to be put into uh, use at any point, say, if Labour come back in. I'm surprised that the Tories haven't done that themselves. They talk about direct discrimination being outlawed by it, indirect discrimination by it, which means that if you discriminate against somebody because you think that they are gay, but it turns out that they are not gay, you're still held liable for that. They also have the um, legislation in here against harassment, which includes the provision of creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating, or offensive environment for the person who is alleging harassment. Now, that's incredibly subjective, and we'll see as we go on how subjective that can be. As mentioned, this is all uh, overseen by the EHRC, so let's look at them very quickly as well. So they derive their power from the Equality Act 2006, which resulted from the government white paper Fairness for All, a new commission for equality and human rights, which is one of the most leftist white paper titles I've ever heard. Section 3 states the EHRC has a general duty to work towards the development of a society where equal rights are rooted. Section 30 of the Equality Act 2006 also allows the EHRC to bring ju judicial review proceedings under the HRA against the public authorities. This is a stronger tool than usual because the EHRC is not subject to the normal requirement of being a victim of a human rights violation. So what this means is that EHRC can just go out like a shark in the water looking for things to bring judicial review to. They can take you to court over anything and there is no requirement for a victim to have stepped forward and brought the case to the EHRC. First of all, once again, this just it brings another reason for why companies need these massive compliance parts of their organisation.
organizations and why they stick to all of the progressive agenda, the intersectional agenda, whatever you want to call it, mainly because they're trying to head off at the pass, have it being brought to court by these guys. Now, let's look at some of the cases that they've got in here. Now, the first one is going to be contentious because it's an organization that I doubt many of you are going to be particularly fond of. But despite that, I don't think it means that they shouldn't have the right to not be sued for promoting their own organization's goals and aims. Now, that's the BNP, the British National Party, basically defunct these days. In fact, I think they are gone at this point. Now, this was following the election of two MEPs for the British National Party in the 2009 European elections. A potential issue of public funding was raised by the Commission as the BNP constitution states that recru recruitment excuse me, is only open to members who are indigenous, Caucasian, and defined ethnic groups emanating from that race. The Commission's legal director, John Wadham, said that the legal advice we've received indicates that the British National Party's constitution and membership criteria, employment practices, and provision of services to constitu uh, constituents and the public may breach discrimination laws, which all political parties are legally obliged to uphold. This relates to the Race Relations Act 1976, which outlaws the refusal or deliberate omission to offer employment on the basis of non-membership of an organisation. Now, this is very interesting because under the Race Relations Act 1976, it may have been illegal technically for the BNP to do this, but there wasn't an official government organization okay. who would be able to just bring this to court without any victim stepping forward. Because previously, I assume, the BNP had been able to get away with this because nobody of non-English ethnicity had tried to apply to join them. Okay. Um, so then the EHRC is able to bring this to court. The EHRC asked the BNP to provide underwritten, uh, written undertakings that there will not be discrimination in its recruitment procedures. The party responded to the letter by stating that it intends to clarify the word white on its website. However, because the EHRC believed the BNP would continue to discriminate against potential or actual members on racial grounds, the commission announced they had issued county court proceedings against it, of which they lost. Yep. Now, that's very interesting because what they did there is the organization said, don't worry, we'll fix this. And the AHR just, C just said, well, we don't believe you were taking you to court anyway. Brilliant. That's how these organizations can function. Now, no matter what you think of the BNP, whether you support them or you don't, whether you think that their ability to discriminate about membership is right or not, I do think that they should have the right to be able to determine the kinds of members that they take on. And this has a big slippery slope effect. The second that you say an organization can't do this, all of a sudden you turn around and say the Boy Scouts only being able to admit boys in, well, that's discrimination as well. So therefore, you're going to have to have the Boy Scouts open up. It doesn't matter that without the legislation, for instance, if we're talking about this trans versus turfs issue, if you repealed this legislation, if you abolished the Equalities Act, all of a sudden, these women's only organisations would not have to worry yeah. because they would be able to have their own organisations where they can just discriminate as to who can enter. They can say no men, no trans women, only biological women. And that wouldn't be against the law and they wouldn't have to worry about it. But, but that means that they can't also then turn around and say no men's only organizations, yeah. which is where the problem comes in and why they want this kind of thing. And uh, just uh, there were some other ones that I could bring, uh, bring forward, but let's just move on to the next link. So this is a PDF that I found through the EHRC website where they talk about uh, the actual definitions and they talk about how this applies to small businesses. So uh, they give an example of the sorts of things that small businesses need to take care of because this will count as discrimination. Okay, are you ready for this example? Do you want to torture me? Does this make you, are you in pain listening to yeah. all of this? Does this upset your liberal sensibilities? Yeah. I'm really sorry about all of this. Uh, but once again, this is important. This is very important for everybody to know. So the example given is that a hair salon owner has a policy of not employing stylists who cover their hair, believing it is important for them to exhibit their flamboyant haircuts. Does this sound like discrimination to you? It's discrimination in terms of hair <laughs> that everybody does. Wrong. It's what? racist. Because it, it, it is clear that this policy puts Muslim and Sikh women at a particular disadvantage, oh, as well as Sikh men who cover their hair. This may be indirect discrimination. No, unless because the policy it doesn't be... say that you have to show your hair. Well, it just says that you're not allowed to have a covering on your head. Ah, okay. Yeah. Because what and what that means is that if you. Uh, hire a Muslim or Sikh person, then you're going to be discriminating against them because it's going to be going against their religion. The other example is a food manufacturer has a rule that birds are forbidden for people working on the factory floor. Does this sound discriminatory to you? 
a hair salon owner. No, a food manufacturer has a rule that beers are forbidden for people working on the factory floor. This is a very simple yes or no answer. You know the answer. You know how the EHRC are going to fall on this. You, you don't want people to... If people have beards and they're in a kitchen, there are increased chances that hair are going to somehow find their way on the plate. Close, but I'm sorry you've just been sued for £200,000 for breaching the Equalities Act, because unless it can be objectively justified, this rule may be indirect religion or belief discrimination against Sikhs and Muslims. There you go. That's why these organisations, they all have to jump through hoops day in, day out, to be able to actually fulfil the purpose of this legislation and meet these stupid requirements. And the worst thing about it might be that it makes office banter literally illegal yeah here's some of the examples just to end this off just so that everybody can understand that the turfs you may agree with what they're trying to do in securing single sex spaces for women the equalities act is absolutely not the way to go about it because all of these examples that i'm going to put forward now are as a direct result of the equality act so a woman in scotland awarded £28,000 after she said that her boss humiliated her in front of colleagues and customers by calling her a dinosaur because she was going through the menopause. Mean, perhaps, you can say that was uncalled for, not £28,000 worth of uncalled for. Other examples included a tribunal ruling that found the phrase cheeky monkey, broadly considered to be innocent banter, crossed the line into racial harassment when it was directed at an employee of Indian origin during a round of golf that had been arranged by his bosses. You've paid, you've had golf paid for, you're having a lovely day out. Someone says cheeky monkey as a little jab that is no racial connotations whatsoever. And you decide, hold up, I can make some good money from this. Hello, government. Likewise, a male employee was found to have suffered harassment at the hands of colleagues when they described him as gay after he told them that he had no interest in football. I'm sorry, why do you need to take this to court? The researchers also cited the case of a 69-year-old plumber who was labelled Half Dead Dave, which, I'm sorry, it's just an... It, it, it's a cheeky name. It's a cheeky <laughs> It's a nickname. cheeky, you have... He's you a, have... He was a cheeky monkey, yeah. and he took him to court over it and won 25 grand for age-related discrimination. So having fun at work is illegal <laughs> because of the Equalities Act. All of the companies that you wish didn't weren't, weren't woke, didn't push all of the agenda, have to because of the Equalities Act. So if the TERFs get their way, great, they get their same-sex spaces, but they've just strengthened a piece of legislation that makes it so that England is objectively a worse place to function. If you appreciated that segment from the podcast The Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium contents on the site, such as the Contemplation series, this episode on Victorian values, arts, and sciences. If you'd like to find out what else is being put out, you can follow on Getter at lotuseaters underscore com on Getter. Thank you and goodbye.